We will go back on the record, Michelle. Okay, we are back on the record. The time is 12.16 p.m. Great, we will resume our hearing from August 14th. Uh, next, we have the budget presentation um, from Northwestern. And I see Mr. Wright and his team. Welcome, thank you all for being here. Thank you, sir, we appreciate being here. Great, and I'll have uh, Mr. Hengstler swear you in and then you can provide your presentation for, uh, we have about 45 minutes scheduled till one o'clock. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Northwestern. I'm gonna read the uh, oath uh, to be uh, administered to witnesses. And after I read it, I'll just have you each go ahead and uh, state your name and raise your right hand. So I'll just have you go person to person so we can get everything on the record okay. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Mr. Casavan. John Casavan, you still on? All right, Steph? Stephanie Rowe, I do. John Minadeo. John Minadeo, I do. Devin Batchelder. Devin Batchelder, I do. Peter Wright, I do. John Casavant, are you on the line? Oh, looks like we lost our board chair. I do expect that uh, he'll jump back on at some point. Um, and when he does, we'll pause uh, and allow him to pledge that oath. That's okay that with works. you? Yep, that works. Very good. I'll, I'll turn it to you, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Foster, and many thanks to the members of the board. We know and certainly appreciate that you have a very difficult job, uh, oftentimes a thankless job, and, and we appreciate your service uh, to the state of Vermont. Um, I want to also take this moment um, to th uh, offer our thanks and appreciation to the healthcare advocate for their support and partnership with the implementation of Act 119. Um, you know, while NMC had, you know, had a used to have a very generous um, financial assistance, Polly, there was a lot of nuanced detail uh, and they were instrumental in helping us get that right. So we're very grateful and I think that uh, is deserving of a call out. Um, you'll, this slide um, shows two pictures. The first in the top right is Emily Allen. Emily is the nurse manager of our ICU and step down unit. She's working with what we call Aspire nurses through the partnership we have with the Vermont Talent Pipeline and the Vermont State University. Like many of our peers, in addition to providing care, NMC is an institution of learning and we engage in countless uh, we engage countless educational institutions across the state and Northeast to train LPNs, LP, uh, LNAs, RNs, radiology technicians, PTs, OTs, physicians assistants, nurse practitioners, and, uh, and many more. The second is something really exciting. This is a picture of Katie Shattuck. She's a pediatric nurse practitioner who joined our team uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Katie and our clinic leadership team opened up a pediatric development clinic for children with autism. This is particularly important because it is a clinic uh, like pretty much no other in the state of Vermont. There are precious few resources um, uh, who are willing to, to do this work and address this work. Um, and it is already full in less than a year. We're looking to expand and we haven't spent a second advertising it. So um, this is just some of the great work that we're doing to meet the needs of Franklin and Grand Isle counties and benefits the state as a whole. We get referrals from all over to this clinic. I want to take an intro, um, so we'll take the next slide, Steph. Uh, a second, uh, again, to introduce our team. Um, John Casavant is our board chair. Mr. Casavant is a multi-generational member of our community. His father was a physician um, at what, what was Curbs and St. Albans Hospital that merged together to become Northwestern Medical Center. And his mother uh, was a nurse who also worked at Curbs. John has served on the NMC board for nearly two decades um, and as vice president at NFP, uh, he has an acute understanding of the insurance market and the needs and struggles of employers across the state. Stephanie Bro is our chief uh, financial officer. Ms. Bro has been with NMC for more than 18 years. She started in our accounting office and has worked her way to the position of chief financial officer where she has served for the last three years. 
John Minadeo. Uh, Dr. Minadeo grew up in the Northwest region as a graduate of the UVM Medical School. He came to NMC right out of his residency and worked in our emergency department for many years. Dr. Minadeo became interested in quality improvement and eventually took a position as the ED medical director before being promoted to the chief medical and quality officer, a position that he's held for about three years. Dr. Minadeo has faithfully served NMC for more than 25 years. Devin Batchelder. Uh, Devin is our decision support and budget manager. He grew up in Franklin County as well and has been a member of the NMC finance, financial team lead, leading the budget process and presentation for the last 18 years. Devin won't be presenting today. Um, however, he is sworn in to answer any technical questions that may come up along the way. So let me just take a quick pause. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Casavant has made his way back on to the program. I am here, Peter. Wonderful. My apologies for a technical glitch. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's just fine. <laughs> uh, John, you have uh, to pause, and uh, we need to we, uh, we need to square you in with the attorney. Thank you. This will be brief. Uh, all right, so please go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, after I state the oath administered witness, you can say I do. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You are sworn in. Thank you. So, uh, Chair Foster and the board, thank you very much for having us here today. Um, I look forward to a time. We can meet in person. I think uh, our decision making and discussion and decision making will be much better when we can do that collectively. <clears throat> I, uh, I think we're at an inflection point in healthcare in Vermont. Uh, as Mr. Wright said, I, I do have uh, long roots in our corner of the state. Uh, my dad practiced medicine in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Unfortunately, left us pretty early. I'm um, uh, he was a general practitioner and my mom a nurse and they had nine kids most of us that reside i guess we all reside in vermont now um, i think i i have three siblings that are in the healthcare profession my wife's an occupational therapist so i think i have as much working knowledge of the system as most lay people um, what we learned when we t uh, heard from dr harmony or hammery excuse me was that we do pretty good work he confirmed the work that we were doing particularly particularly around quality and engagement and engagement with our with our um, our community partners and I think the the fact that we're probably one of the highest quality lowest cost hospitals in the state further confirms that I think we need to understand Dr. Hamery's message to us which was we have an issue around transportation housing long-term care mental health, workforce, very little of that is within our control. And I think um, uh, we, you as regulators and the, and the hospitals, the community hospitals need to work together to make sure that we right this ship sooner rather than later. We'll talk, Dr. Menadeo will talk about quality and our journey on high reliability. Peter will talk about our work around culture and engagement and stephanie will talk about stewardship or sustainability the three pillars to our um, strategic plan as i said i think a lot of what we're talking about in the system right now is beyond our control and as healthcare providers part of that part of the provider network and as regulators we need to figure out how to work together better um, and so i uh, look forward to this presentation from our leadership team and hope you will find that we have listened to your direction and that uh, we have uh, taken that um, very seriously and how we've prepared our budget and are doing the work that uh, you would expect us to do. Thank you. Thank you, John. We're going to hand it over to Dr. Minadeo who's going to start walking us through uh, some some quality insights. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we wanted to spend a little time on those pillars that you just saw on the strategic plan um, to say kind of where we've been, where we think we're going before we get into the um, budget request. 
So um, as John said, I'll start with the quality and safety pillar, hand it over to Peter, uh, and he'll hand it over to Stephanie that will then um, lead into the budget, the actual budget request. So uh, the quality and safety pillar. So starting in, in 2021, <clears throat> we really cemented the organization's philosophy that focusing on quality and safety is really going to be the path to for us to achieve our mission, which is to provide exceptional care to our community. And that all of the recruitment, retention, and finances will be secondary benefits. So to this end, what we did is we dove hard into high reliability training for the entire organization. If you're familiar with this, you know that that really the underpinning of that is really culture change, which takes time. But some of the tenets of culture change of that culture is providing a workplace where everyone is on the lookout for failure points. Everyone feels safe in raising a safety concern, regardless of their title, um, that we assume good intentions and we examine the process when something goes wrong. We really reflect on how errors do occur, and we try to standardize processes and communication in order to mitigate them before uh, it reaches the patient. So since starting that, we have 100% of our employees uh, and including our physicians uh, take this course within three months of their hire. We've also, um, as it says there, launched a, a hospital-wide hand hygiene initiative, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and as mentioned, created our strategic plan. 2022, um, we launched our um, um, sepsis bundle compliance um, sort of initiative, um, and that will also get into more detail on our uh, subsequent slide. Process improvement is a third key factor. So um, Dr. Chasson was the former head of the Joint Commission, published a paper several years ago and noted uh, that their study of the highest performing hospitals, they had three things in common. One, they had the, a leadership from the board on down, leadership commitment to zero preventable harm. The second was that um, they had a safe culture, um, uh, as I just sort of talked about, um, so that errors and near misses are voiced, recorded, and cataloged. And then in order for that to be meaningful, they had to have the third part of it, which is a robust process improvement uh, team and uh, focus. So you collect the data, and um, you need to then change, look at the system and the process and use what you found to try to change process so that uh, someone else in that position can't make that mistake so that um, they don't re recur. So those are the three things. And what you see on here, are the daily Gemba rounds and uh, organizational safety brief that happens every day um, are two of those tactics. Um, a third one that's not on there is we publish a zero preventable harm report every month which um, details um, the preventable harm reports that are followed by CMS. And in the last 30 days, did we have zero? And if we didn't, what are they? Um, in addition, in 2022, we formed a Patient Family Advisory Council. This is a group of community members who um, have had e either good or bad experiences uh, or both uh, in healthcare, but they have a commitment to help uh, us improve. And so, they form a sort of internal um, feed, um, focus group to provide us feedback on policies, on um, process or design or signage, et cetera. Um, and then in 2023, um, we formed a physician-led uh, patient experience task force. And in that, we have either guests, speakers, or we watch TED Talks together, and we have discussions on softer skills, on the perception of the patient's de definition of quality. How do they assess quality and, and, uh, um, ha and how do we make their experience better in our communications? Um, we talk about how culture drives outcomes. And then we also talk about how physicians are leaders, whether they have a title of a director or not, and that um, they need to know that because they have a disproportionate influence on that culture that is so vital to our outcomes. Uh, and John spoke about the refreshed uh, strategic plan, and uh, I'll let Peter uh, talk about the engagement survey as well as the collaborative in, some, in his section. So we can go to the next slide. Please.
Uh, All right, Stephanie. showing showing hand hygiene on my side, but not on yours, huh? Uh, I don't see it on mine. So much for no technology glitches. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing the hand hygiene slide or the, the pillar slide? Or no. The, there we go. There we go. Now we have okay. it. Delay. Big delay. Sorry. Okay. Um, Chair Foster, can you can you guys see that? We can. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So um, as, as I mentioned, this is our hand hygiene initiative. So we started in 2021. We used um, guidance uh, um, and direction from the World Health Organization best practice. Um, and you can see that we began with a compliance of, of about mid 60s, and that's 60 percentage uh, percent of the time uh, of 60% of, of the appropriate hand hygiene opportunities and defined by the World Health Organization of the five the five moments. Um, and so um, our compliance rate uh, gradually uh, increased, um, and that is gradually is the word, uh, and goes up and down just like all process improvement, uh, and, but you keep at it with teamwork and persistence. We slowly change the culture, which is really changing habits and establishing uh, es establishing those kind of muscle memory. Um, and this is this is a combined uh, data from our staff and our medical staff. They're very engaged in this as well. Um, and just to provide some context, um, there was a study in JAMA in 2021 that studied uh, hand hygiene compliance rates at a, a major hospital system in Chicago. And uh, they found that their baseline uh, prior to COVID uh, compliance rate matched the national average, which is between 50 and 60% as they cited it. Um, they found that it did go up with heightened awareness on the COVID units during the height of COVID to over 90%. But then once uh, um, we were kind of more in the shadow of COVID, uh, they checked it again and it dropped back down to 55%. So we're very proud of having sustained our uh, high compliance rate well above uh, the national uh, um, average. And so we think this will affect patient care, obviously infection rates. Um, and this goes back to an example of culture change and, and high reliability. Next slide, please. So here's another example of using data and applying persistent <clears throat> methodical uh, process improvement to standardize processes. For background, um, sepsis is an overwhelming bacterial infection that has a high mortality rate. Timely diagnosis is challenging, uh, but uh, important and interventions positively affect outcomes. And so there's been some standardized bundle compliance uh, bundles that uh, have been proven to be effective. These uh, uh, are occurring at three hour and six hour marks um, where different labs, prescribed amount of fluids need to be delivered, um, antibiotics need to be delivered, other interventions have to happen. And so it's complex, um, but we've used uh, a collective focus, um, standardized identification tools, standardized communication alerts, teamwork between doctors, nurses in, uh, in the lab with communications, perseverance. You can see that we've, again, gone up and down, but uh, overall we've increased our sepsis bundle compliance rate to um, at or above the national average in just the space of just one year. The next slide shows um, CMS penalties. CMS uses various levers to try to inspire hospitals to improve, and one of them is monetary uh, kickbacks. And um, this is an example of over the past three years of, of what we have had to uh, pay back. And so the blue line represents a um, readmission penalty, and there's been slow and steady uh, improvement there. And the yellow line represents hospital acquired conditions. The next slide. So this, um, these are uh, just some resources that we take advantage of through the um, Vermont Program for uh, Quality and Healthcare. This shows a level of our engagement. The next slide um, is data that I think you've requested us to get from them um, about uh, our outcomes. And so again, from the Vermont Program of Quality and Healthcare, um, 
illustrating that on these uh, quality measures that we are performing at the national rate, which is depicted by the blue colored circles on the far right column. Uh, the top section is our hospital acquired infections. So similarly to hospital acquired inf conditions, these are um, things that happen to patients with while they're in the hospital that um, they didn't come in with or not a natural um, consequence of their disease process. And so one could get infections while they're in the hospital, different types. If there's a catheter associated in their bladder, uh, um, for instance, would be a catheter associated urinary infection. Um, <clears throat> and then the middle section is some mortality rates for different uh, conditions. And then the final section is the 30 day uh, readmission uh, <clears throat> rate. And so, yeah. So then finally, this is, um, this is something you also asked us to do is to go to this independent uh, uh, data group called SAGE. And um, once again, um, there are, they're showing outcomes on readmissions um, and safety measures and mortality. The orange or yellow there shows that uh, there's inadequate data to, to, um, to report out on that metric, but where the, the blue sections show that where there is sufficient data that we perform at the uh, same as the national average. There would be red if they're uh, there depicted if we were performing below. And so uh, performing at the national rate, you know, we think that is an acceptable starting place, but that's, you know, our sites and expectations are much higher than that. We know that healthcare is complex and the complexity is increasing by the day. Um, and so the only way we can perform at the highest level, we think, is to focus on culture, communications, systems thinking, and unending process improvement. So like the tortoise who wins the race, we need to be focused, methodical, and above all, persistent. So thank you for listening. That concludes my summary of the quality pillar, and I'll hand it off to Peter to discuss the engagement pillar. Thanks, Dr. Minadeo. So we covered that quality data because we're committed to providing the right care in the right place at the right time every time. In addition to being the right thing to do, it is also known to reduce cost. Um, the best way to do that is to have a highly engaged workforce. Um, and, and our team, as you've probably heard from other organizations, we feel our team is really special. Um, we're going through a lot of change. So in 2022, we uh, worked with our vendor, Prescani, to conduct a, an engagement and culture of safety survey. We repeated that survey last January, and these are the summary results. As you can see, our summary score, 3.89 out of five, I would say, well, you know, that's okay. It's not great. It's not where we want to be, but it's a, a decent place for us to start. The dark green and light green are areas of high engagement and high engagement. The yellow is uh, uh, team member, excuse me, that um, reflected as neutral. You can see that's a little less than a third. And the red area are employees that are disengaged. Now you might think, oh gosh, you're gonna, we're gonna really focus in on those disengaged employees. Um, and really where we're focusing in is on the employees that are neutral. Um, we feel that's our greatest opportunity to advance and get them into the engaged or highly engaged area. We know when they're engaged, they will stay. And when we know we have a consistent workforce, we can provide that consistent quality and become that high reliable organization. Um, what's important in, in this is that the key indicators for engagement all increased across the board in a statistically significant way. Uh, the top statistic you have underneath the circle is um, increase of 0.27, that is the, the key areas. Um, we did so well that that green arrow filled in means it was statistically significant. We did so well um, that Prescani actually called us and said, hey, we've never seen improvement like this um, from where you were to where you are help us understand what you did so we can start to gather some of those best practices. Now, before we get excited about that big jump and where we are, I think it's important to put it into perspective. We're still in the 27th percentile when compared against the Prescani National Database and the 36th percentile when compared against AHA Region 1, which is the Northeast. Um, so, you know, nothing necessarily to celebrate except for uh, continued advancement. And we also know that if we increase 
in the same way in the next time we will be over the 50th percentile. So we know that that is meaningful and we're well on our way. And something we're the most proud of is the idea of, um, of the seven to 800 team members that we uh, surveyed, 72% responded. So anybody who does surveys knows that that's an incredibly strong response rate. So we have uh, an understanding that this is tr really, truly how our organization sits today. Next slide, please. This is uh, an uh, a report on the key indicators uh, and, and where our responses were. Again, you can see uh, those solid green arrows to the right on the score and trending, which indicate a statistically significant increase. You can see our national and region one rating. Um, we tend to look more at region one because it's a little more of our neighbors and and uh, you know the culture of the Northeast. Uh, and you can see in some of those areas we're at or slightly above the 50th percentile. All to say all indicators going up all going up in a in a meaningful way um, and well on our way to a more engaged workforce, which we know leads to greater quality, which we know leads to reduced cost. So um, uh, let's go. Uh, I think I'm going to hand it off to Stephanie, who's going to start to talk to you about um, cost in the budget. Thank you, Peter, um, and good afternoon, everybody. I am going to try to speak and drive at the same time, so just holler if there's another big delay. Um, Peter, maybe you can do that for me. <laughs> uh, I'm really going to cover two things today. So you heard Dr. Minadeo talk about where we're currently at with our quality pillar, and you just heard Peter talk about where we're currently at with our engagement pillar. I'm going to start by talking about where we are currently at with our stewardship pillar, and then I'm going to shift uh, into talking about the budget request for 2025. So this graph in front of you, uh, this shows 10 years worth of operating margins for Northwestern Medical Center. Um, it's a pretty easy graph to read. It's not terribly pretty. Um, you know, between us, Peter likes to refer to this as the slide of doom. Um, but it's not doom, and we're going to talk about it. Um, there is a lot of negative, but I really want to focus on the improvement that we have made in this past year. So NMC ended fiscal year 23 with a negative operating margin of almost 7%. Um, absolutely not sustainable, not where we can be or where we want to be. But in the current fiscal year, we're projecting an operating margin while still negative, um, much, much improved, a small negative operating uh, margin somewhere around 1%. And the last point on the graph shows what we are budgeting for next year. So again, just like our quality pillar and just like our engagement pillar, we're not where we ultimately want to be, but we're making uh, good progress. Um, I think one of the things that NMC does really well is we're consistently and constantly looking for ways to reduce expenses or to tap into new funding that might be available to us, right? It's just part of our day-to-day -day work. And this is just some examples of that work. This is not a full list um, of everything that we have done in the current year. And I'm really only going to talk about a few of these, but, but there really are many. Um, NMC applied for and received a one-time Medicare low volume payment for 1.5 million, so that was a big one for us. Um, Medicare low volume payments are not automatic. It's really up to NMC to recognize that we meet all of the criteria and to complete the application process. It's actually a very time-consuming process, um, but we did that and we were successful. Uh, we applied for and received a three-year Nursing Pathways grant. I think you've probably already heard at least one or other organization talk about this grant. We're really excited and really grateful that we got this grant um, because whether we got it or not, we have to do the work and we have to make the investment in um, our nursing schools and um, all of those specialty tech positions as well. Um, we're struggling with recruitment just like uh, every hospital that's already come in front of you. So that was worth almost $200,000 in the current year. Uh, we made a couple of changes to our pharmacy formulary. 
So we identified a couple of medications that we were purchasing, and these were high dollar medications. And we worked with our physicians and with our teams to identify some substitutions that were much less expensive. But that only works, and we would only make that change if those substitutions showed the same or better clinical outcomes. So it really needed to be a partnership between the clinical teams and administration, um, looking at that evidence, looking at those studies, and we have been able to implement changes uh, in the current fiscal year of almost $170,000. Um, Peter is going to talk shortly about the New England uh, Health Collaborative, but one of the very first initiatives of that group was this opportunity for NMC to share our chief people officer with another community hospital. So that hospital, their HR leader had left the organization and they were going to need to recruit, but they needed someone in the meantime. And so they reached out to us to see if we could help. And we were able to get part of the salaries and benefits for our employee paid for and count that as other revenue. And that organization was able to, you know, get help at a much lower cost than going to an outside vendor or an outside organization and finding an interim. So it was really a win-win for both organizations. Uh, we have deferred wage increases for all team members for 90 days in the current fiscal year. We reduced the wage increase for our leaders, meaning if all of the staff got a 3% increase, leaders got 2%, so leaders got less. And we have held intentionally certain open FTEs because we just don't think it's the right time. We don't think it would be responsible right now to fill those. And so all of those things added together have saved us over a half a million dollars. And then the last one I'll mention is the leaders of our clinical units for a 90-day period this year, they worked one open shift per week so that that shift did not need to be worked by a traveler at a very high rate or somebody on overtime. Our leaders really stepped up and they embraced that initiative and they got that done. And that saved us more than $40,000 in the current year. All right, I'm gonna shift now and talk about the budget request for 2025. So this is how NMC looks against the three established benchmarks for the budget. NMC is looking for a 6.8% growth in net patient revenue, and that improves access to care. NMC is asking for a 7% increase in its commercial rate or our prices, or I think you guys refer to that as our charges. Um, and that allows us to maintain strong operational efficiency and NMC is budgeting for a positive 1% operating margin. Uh, looking first at the net patient revenue increase and in the access to care, uh, we heard loud and clear from our community members, we heard from all of you, we heard from others around the state that uh, access to care needed to be improved. And we absolutely agree, right? Our data shows that patients are waiting too long to get an appointment to see their physicians. So we worked really hard um, to recruit providers and we've had a lot of success. We've had success in almost all of our specialties, every area indicated in green. So there are only two areas where we have not been able to recruit and we will continue to try. Um, we won't stop until we're successful. We haven't been able to budget increases in those areas until that happens, but again, we're not, we're not giving up. So when we look at that recruitment and that improved access to care, this is an actual roster of all of the providers that have really recently joined NMC or they're going to be joining NMC. And over on the right hand side with the green arrows and the percentages, that's the corresponding increase in volume that we have been able to build into our budget as a result of these providers coming on board. So this will absolutely significantly reduce wait times for patients who are waiting three months or six months or even longer to get an appointment. 
Uh, so now I want to talk about the commercial rate increase request um, and NMC's operational efficiency. So this first graph is one that you're very familiar with. It's your uh, graph, it's your information, and it shows uh, cumulative expense growth for a five-year period for all of the Vermont hospitals. And NMC is to the far left. We are the very lowest on this graph with the total right around 17%. Uh, this next slide, I know it looks just like a slide that we saw a couple minutes ago, but it's not a duplicate. This is a new list. So these are items, these are expense reductions that we have built into the 2025 budget. Um, so this is where hospitals say they are taking on risk or helping um, with the concept of affordability. NMC is absolutely doing that with this list. And again, I'm not going to go through all of them, and this was not a full list, but I'm just going to go through a few of them. Um, we are going to implement bedside medication verification in our operating rooms. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to maximize 340B pharmaceutical savings. Um, I think a couple of hospitals in Vermont have already done this. And so we're reaching out to them to say, how did you do it? What did you learn? You know, what worked well? What didn't work well? Uh, but that's a big one at 1.2 million. Uh, we have been able to recruit a second pathologist to our organization, so we will go from one employed pathologist to two, and that recruitment allows us to reduce the amount of pathology services that we need to purchase from an outside group, and we're able to save over $132,000 there. Uh, we have also pulled out uh, almost $200,000 worth of advertising expenses in this budget. We had advertising expenses to let our community know about all of the new providers joining. So we're still going to do that. We're just going to have to do that in a different way. Um, but we're committed to doing that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Peter, who's going to talk about the New England Collaborative Health Network and the uh, expense reductions we have helped our community partners uh, take advantage of. Thank you, Stephanie. Last year in the budget hearing, you heard me talk about the Vermont Collaborative Network that quickly expanded to the New England Collaborative Network, and we firmly believe that that will turn into the Northeast Collaborative Network really soon. Those initiatives you've heard from some of our peers during their budget hearings, and we'll, we'll, we will continue to do so. But what I want to highlight today is a statistic, Chair Foster, I shared with you and when we met not too long ago, um, for everyone else to hear, is that we are uh, doing something very different. There are collaborative networks across the country. They all work in different ways. Um, the, the way, what we are pioneering is the idea of opening this up far beyond hospitals. So what the initiative that we're the most proud of this year is we're going to take $1.4 million of cost out of healthcare in the next year, and you're never going to see that. You're never going to see it in our budget presentation. It'll never be reflected in our numbers because it doesn't benefit us. It benefits our strategic partners. So by allowing home health agencies, primary care partners, um, mental health agencies to to come together with us to do group purchasing, to make um, um, a capital purchase together and to, to come together to buy insurance benefits, we are reducing their out-of-pocket costs um, because we believe that our focus is not only on the hospital, but being a leader and a collaborator within the healthcare network um, across our community and across the state. So this is really exciting to us. It solidifies our partnerships um, in the community, and uh, it does a great job to make sure that primary care, mental health, home health, and other key partners um, are able to stay viable, um, are able to minimize their rate increases um, uh, to the insurance market, um, and, and really keep us strong moving into the future. So just something we want to highlight, something that you don't always see what happens outside of our budget, outside of our four walls, but things that like this that happen every day. So I'll turn it back to Stephanie. All right, thanks, Peter. Um, another way we looked at operational efficiency was through the National Academy for State Health Policy. So again, this was a reference that you provided to us. 
Um, and when we look at that data, NASHP shows hospital operating costs per adjusted discharge, and NMC shows up at $11,022. Um, which is below the state median, and it's also below the national median. Um, this slide, it shows an internal report that we use. This is an internal way Step, that we look uh, at. Op you got it. Yep. It was delayed. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. This is an internal report that we use to look at operational efficiency. Um, we call these productivity reports and every department leader gets one every two weeks. So after the end of every pay period, we send out productivity reports. And we are able to generate these reports using a system called Vantage. We have access to the Vantage system through our partnership with Ovation. And Ovation gets uh, staffing and labor benchmarks from a national group called Premier. So the premier benchmarks are loaded into the system. We then load in our actual volumes and our actual paid hours. And the report tells us whether we met the benchmark or not. If the score is less than 100, we have an opportunity to improve. If the score is over 100, then we actually beat the benchmark. Um, we have the option to pick what benchmark to use, and the vast majority of our departments, we set them to the 75th percentile benchmark. Um, there are some where we set it to the 50th, um, but most are set to the 75th. And this example in front of you, I know you can't read it and that's okay. Um, this is the progressive care unit. So for this particular um, pay period, they had a productivity score of an 89. So they may have had lighter volumes on the floor that, that pay period. Their six month average score is a 94 and their fiscal year to date score is a 96. Um, we have the ability to roll all of the departments together and look at a cumulative score for the organization. So uh, the most recent, the last pay period, the most recent cumulative score for NMC uh, was a 97. So a very strong score. Uh, going back to some NASHB data, they also look at how hospital expenses in this way. They break expenses down into major categories. Um, so in this case, direct patient care labor is the line represented in red. And then you have some other expense categories like non-direct uh, patient care labor in yellow, capital in green, et cetera. Um, and I really want to just look at the last couple of years. This shows the growth in every category over time. But when we look at the last two data points on here, what we see is a very intentional increase to direct patient care labor. And all of the other expense categories are really flat or even, you know, going down slightly. If we drill into that direct patient care labor as a percent of hospital expenses, um, NASHB will compare NMC to the other PPS hospitals in the state, and we have the highest percentage of direct patient care labor as a percent of hospital expense. Um, another way, you know, we look at operational efficiency is to look at uh, rate increase requests or approved rate increases. Uh, uh, we went back to the inception of the Green Mountain Care Board and looked at the average annual increase for each hospital, um, and Northwestern Medical Center is the lowest um, at the top of that graph at 3.87, and there's a 45% difference between the lowest and the highest. Um, I also, you know, want to specifically mention that NMC has not negotiated reimbursement increases with commercial insurers above and beyond our approved rate increases. Uh, also, looking at prices, we would call this reimbursement on our side, but you have seen this information before. So this is from Rand 5.0. Um, and this shows the standardized price for outpatient services. NMC shows up at the very bottom of this graph, and we're not really sure why we show up as Quorum Health Corporation, so we're going to get to the bottom of that, um, but that is NMC. 
Uh, so just to wrap things up for me, you know, again, uh, each of our pillars really is a multi-year journey. Um, it's about progress. It's not about perfection. Um, we have tried very hard not to look at just one single data point. Um, we have showed you where we're currently at. Some of that data isn't perfect yet. Most of that data is not perfect yet. But we've also shown you where we want to go. Um, we think if we look at expenses, if we look at prices, if we look at um, what we charge, if we look at history of rate increase requests, that this really tells a story of an organization that is strong um, operational efficiency and, and has been and good stewards. Um, you know, we want to go from a small negative margin to a small positive margin. And ultimately, we think a financially sustainable margin is somewhere around 3%. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Peter. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Uh, this is a great picture. This is uh, Team NMC at the first ever Pride Parade here in St. Albans. Uh, we're very involved uh, with the community at every step um, as they continue to, to celebrate everything that's important about being in Vermont. Um, you heard a quality message, you heard an engagement message, and you heard a financial stewardship message. Um, all of which are things that you asked us to engage with. So we want you to know that you asked, we listened, uh, and provided the data that you are asking for. Um, NMC has provided credible and sufficient evidence that our budget improves access in an organization with strong organizational efficiency. Um, what we are doing is hard work and it reduces expenses, not just within our own organization, but with our strategic partners across the community. And as you know, community hospitals have an important role to play in providing uh, you know, high quality, affordable care in Vermont and NMC continues to be a leader in that space. I wanna end this presentation by talking to you. We've often talked about affordability. We're gonna to talk to you about value. Now I'm gonna apologize in advance, I'm gonna ask you to think about math, not actually do math, but think about how math is done. When I talk about value, I talk about a fraction. I want you to think of a fraction of quality over cost, which is to say the way to make value go up is either to improve quality or to lower cost, right? We know our, our basic numbers around fractions are you make the numerator, numerator go up or the denominator go down and the value of that increases. We've clearly demonstrated whether it is price, what we charge, what we've asked for rate increase, how our expense growth has been over the years, um, that we are a leader in the state about responsible costs. And we continue to look for avenues, as Stephanie pointed out, to bring those costs down or to make sure that they grow at a slow and sustainable rate. We are at the very beginning of our quality journey. And as you can see by what Dr. Minadeo pointed out, we are already at the national median, the national average in many areas. And we really haven't kicked it into high gear yet as we move through that cultural change, as we increase the engagement of our team members, we will slowly, methodically, and sustainably change the culture um, in our within our organization and increase quality. So as we continue to reduce cost, as we continue to increase quality, we will increase the value exponentially um, of the value of the healthcare services that, that we provide our community. So with that, Chair Foster, we want to say thank you for the opportunity to tell you about our story, to tell you about our continued journey. It's something we're incredibly proud of. It's something that we hope you look at and reflect and say, NMC is doing what we're asking them to do, and they are indeed a leader in what is arguably an incredibly difficult task of trying to make health care increasingly high value and increasingly accessible. Thank you, sir. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you. We appreciate the remarks and for using the, the tools that we provided. It was very helpful. Uh, open up to the other board members for their questions. I can jump in. Um, for the 10 years prior to joining the board, I worked a lot on um, helping organizations assess where they are on their HRO journey and to monitor their progress over time. So. Um, I, I reckon that the language here brings back a lot of fond memories. Um, and I just want to commend you on, on your commitment to the journey you're on and the improvements that you've made in 
also maintained. Um, I wonder if you have thoughts on how regulators could help facilitate the work that you're doing. Uh, that's an excellent question. I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna defer to Dr. Minadeo first as as our chief medical and quality officer. Does he have any thoughts about that? And then um, you know, Mr. Casavan, Stephanie, and I can chime in after. Uh, thank you. I don't think I'm the right person to talk about the regulators. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I think when it comes to policy. Um, you know, as somebody who spends time in the policy space, understand that there is, while, while we know high quality care and, and highly reliable care uh, results in a lower cost, it does require an investment and it does take time. And so regulators can help recognize the investment. I think regulators can call out you know, where we're making investments to know how much we're spending to go down that journey, where we would like to spend more money. I will tell you, you know, we're not spending all the money that we want to, to go down that journey. John's quality team, they'd love to have two, three more process improvement folks on their team. We have one. We made a commitment to have one person completely dedicated to nothing else but process improvement this year. Uh, I'd love to have two or three um, because I think that would accelerate the process. We simply couldn't afford to add that to the budget. Um, as as you can see, we've already struggled to stay within the parameters that you asked us to stay within. Um, yeah. So that's certainly um, one area. I think uh, the, I appreciate the the thoughtfulness, and I, it's a hard question. I've been thinking about it a lot um, as well, and I I, I think um, you know the obvious easy answer is you know give us more money or allow us to have more money. But I think a more subtle um, answer, maybe a more useful one long term, is um, help point at places to look in your in your budget and in your organization. Almost like um, this the Swiss cheese model that you're all probably using about um, sure. errors and and harm. Um, if we were another tool to help identify where to look. I think that that would be useful. Um, sure. So I, I, you know, certainly having having statewide resources that that help, you know, in, in bringing us together and 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 saying, hey, we, we want everyone to go on a high reliable journey. So we're going to help support that and standardize it. Here's a here's a shoot at the moon. My peers will probably all hate me for saying it, but, you know, how would quality, how would high reliability, how, how would patient care improve if we all were on the same electronic medical record, mm -hmm. right? So, so part of what our struggle is every day is the communication between getting access to information, which is pretty good, right? But, but how much money do we spend in, in our own individual technology connection and even statewide connections that if, if we all said, hey, we're going to be on this electronic medical record and the database is going to be one database and it's going to live in a safe place where, you know, no one's going to get inappropriate access to that data, but all the access that they need. How would that improve high reliability? How would that improve um, our quality journey? I think that's a, a great opportunity. Um, you know, when we look at where high reliability slips. And when we look at, I talked about the right care in the right place at the right time. You know, I we would have spent time on this, but we just didn't have it um, in the presentation today to talk about the number of people that are continued to be stuck in the wrong place. You know, whether that is people suited for long-term care that are still stuck in our inpatient unit, whether that is mental health patients, um, you know, I'm really excited about the pediatric unit that's coming online um, in southwestern Vermont. We've often thought, hey, Net, we have a pediatric unit. We have a lot of general adults. Wouldn't it be great if we had a geriatric unit? It's something that um, we've offered to to talk about and commit to. So um, I, I think helping us open up more appropriate places for care where we tend to um, you know, get distracted is when we're taking care of patients that shouldn't be in a hospital. Um, mm -hmm. That diverts our resources, that distracts our attention and takes time away from the things that, that we really need to do and the patients that we really need to care for. Um, well, I, and, and quite frankly, is repeated areas of violence and creates disengagement with our staff. I hear you. I appreciate the thoughtful response. Um, I think 
um, I'm going to reflect on all of that in, in the spirit of, of identifying areas to, to look that I haven't heard about in your presentation. But after reviewing your budget, I, I got a few questions. Um, the in your 24 budget, your your total margin was budgeted at 2.8 and is now projected at 6.9. Could you say a little bit more about what happened there? What led to that variance in total margin? Sure, I'll ask Stephanie to answer that question. Yeah, uh, it's been a good year in the stock market, right? Okay. Yep. <laughs> that yep. that really is the answer. Um, and you know, I I would love to. We do budget for interest and dividends, right? We do, um, but what we don't budget for is just any sort of unrealized gains or losses because we just have no idea. Um, but yeah. that is the difference that you're seeing. Yep. Um, I want to turn for a moment to your profit and loss statement and your your budgeted free care has, has grown from 1.6 million in 2020 to 5.6 in 2025, that's one of the largest increases I've seen in reviewing budgets. Um, yet at the same time, your bad debt has grown from 10 million to 17, which is also among the highest in the state. Could you describe for me, please, your efforts to slow the growth of bad debt uh, in your community? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I don't like our ratio. I don't want our ratio to be, you know, what it is. Um, we've had, we've done some really tangible things over the years. I was thinking about this and reflecting about it the other day. Um, you know, not things you probably haven't heard before, but we placed financial counselors right at the front of the hospital um, to try to increase that, that free care or, or, um, discounted care number. We um, years ago actually went to 400% of the federal poverty level in our policy. So we made some, some changes to Act 119, but that wasn't one of them. We were already there. Um, we had all of our counselors at the front of the hospital become um, certified health assisters, right, to help people sign up for Medicaid or for some insurance product. So I've looked at like, OK, every year we we really are trying something tangible. So I attribute all of those things to the increase that we're seeing um, in the financial assistance and free care line. But on the other side, you know, I do need to shift some focus and attention on bad debt. Um, so we're we're going to be doing that work. I know it's happening across the state, but we all still need to dig in and look at that. Um, I just can't take that as an answer of like it's happening to all of us. So it is what it is. Um, we're really going to, you know, maybe do some focus groups to try to understand, you know, what is it? Should we have done something different up front when you were physically here from a collection standpoint? Do we need to offer something different on our bills or our statements? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of work to do. Right. Yeah, I Mr. Walsh, I'm going to add. I'm going to add something to that. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit unpopular, but I think it it needs to be said because it reflects the reality. Um, we're we're relentless when it comes to aggressively saying how can we help. You know, even before someone goes on charity care or financial assistance, we're like, hey, you're you're eligible for Medicaid. You're the, we have a, a a group and a small army of people that really lean in hard and heavy to help people get access to the programs that they deserve access to. Where we struggle and where things often end up in that in that bad debt column is people don't want to play ball right you you we can't just assign something to the financial assistance program they have to fill out forms they have to create disclosures um and there are a cadre of people who just won't do it um and i will tell you if megan smith who's our director of financial patient financial services were here, many of them use very colorful language about how and why they aren't going to do that. Um, and so yeah. we we work really hard to help people understand that we can't just assign it. We have to have these forms filled out. That is, that is a requirement of us in order to measure need, right? Yeah. And when it yeah. usually comes to those to those assets, people are really, really hesitant. Um, and whether that's distrust or uh, hiding or, or something else, I, I will not make a statement because I don't know. Um, but what I know is we get a tremendous amount of resistance in that 
in that vein. And it's really hard right. because look, it makes us look great. The more we get from one yeah. bucket into the other makes look us yeah. look better. So we absolutely want to make that shift as Stephanie said. Yeah, I understand. And I, and I think we hear that um, regularly when, when talking about this topic. And, and I think, I wonder if this topic would be something that you might be able to bring to your learning collaborative to talk about, because I, I don't doubt for a moment everything that you just said. I think from a research standpoint, um, uh, particularly information from ProPublica, um, a lot of the people who also aren't filling that out is because they're overwhelmed with the housing crisis, their, their yeah. transportation difficulties and food insecurity. And so they're certainly not hiding anything. They just can't find the time and the wherewithal. Their lives are at, at, in chaos at, a, at this moment. And so um, it's a tough problem. And, it is. And maybe the, maybe the learning collaborative could help. Yeah, I totally agree. And we're also open mm -hmm. to anybody who uh, has figured out how to do it. We're absolutely willing to learn from from anybody on this. And I, you know, right. maybe this is one of those initiatives um, that the state can can help us with by doing some kind of study. You know, we we make no assertions about the why and all the things you talked about. We've we've had recent conversations. We've been down to the, um, you know, one of the shelters where folks get housed and where they can get food and we heard all of those stories and we're working with those folks to figure out hey uh, you know how can we help you here what, what yeah. are the things that we can do well um i'd like to switch to it to an, another measure the the Lown institute has a fair share index um they uh, build that index off of the uh, 990s that you all submit and they look at com the dollar amount of community benefit provided in a year related to the tax exemptions received for an organization. And in 2023, according to that institute, your community benefit amounted to $4 million, which is quite high. The tax exemptions totaled about $7 million, meaning that you received $3 million more in tax breaks than you contributed to the community. That number seems large, but it places you in the middle of the pack in Vermont, right? And where there's a range from one hospital that is positive $8 million, meaning they're doing $8 million more of community benefit than they receive, to a low of negative $19 million. Um, but in the spirit of helping direct you to you, this organization as a regulator, those are things that I'm interested in. and. Um, directing efforts in your high reliability journey to try to understand those numbers. That would be, I, I think, um, something to look at. Um, the community needs assessment that you did in 2022. It's great. It's really, really uh, well done. And the, the top needs are affordability, transportation, mental health, substance use concerns, food insecurity. And interesting, something we don't see in other, in, other hospitals, physical and emotional safety. There's a lot of people in your community who um, it sounds like they're scared. Um, and so I want to try to, um, I'm trying to align that with the volume increases and the staffing increases that you're you're bringing in. And are those the two orthopedists, the cardiologists, the um, podiatrists, are, and the focus on increasing access, how do you see those aligning or not aligning with the community needs that you found in the, in the um, needs assessment? Sure, so clearly, you know, the community had a great need as you saw from the, the wait times and the lines and how long it took to get access. So the obvious answer to your question is we're bringing them in just to deal with what we know is the obvious backlog and painful waits that, that folks have to do um, when they don't decide to go somewhere else because they don't want to wait. And, and as you know, they can go somewhere else and they wait there as well. Um, 
you know, we focus a lot on our own internal psychological safety. So this is about, you know, f making sure that everybody feels comfortable raising their hand when they when they think that something isn't going right. You heard Dr. Minadeo talk about that in our high reliability journey. It's not something that we just say we're going to do. We, we talk about it. We talk about, and, and I use myself as often as I can, how it is not only acceptable but expected to challenge everybody in the organization organization for the sake of whether it's patient safety, family member safety, or our own team member safety, including challenging the CEO, which I'm very proud to say my staff um, is, is leaning into more and more uh, with every day that I'm, I'm here. Um, that's really important to us. We launched a new initiative um, about violence. As, as you know, violence in our emergency department, violence on our inpatient unit, violence even in our clinics um, is rising and, and creates uh, safety issues, not only for our team members, but for our other patients who are here and, and have to hear and experience that. Um, so we've created new signage, new policies. Um, we have a zero tolerance for those things, and we're working more and more um, with the appropriate agents which aren't always law enforcement, I think is important to point out. Um, we're, we've just launched a, a, our next community needs assessment, so we're in the process of doing those surveys now. Um, and we're really interested in the, com the constituencies that don't engage with us or don't engage in, in healthcare at all um, because of safety issues. And most notably um, are the, the um, the the tribe in uh, Masiskoi, the Abenaki, who um, you know are very hesitant to engage with any healthcare system based on Vermont's long and unfortunate practices of eugenics. Um, they're in our backyard. We have made um, uh, measured efforts to both culturally align, to understand and celebrate their culture, and to let them know that um, we appreciate that diversity and it's something that is uh, we want to learn more about and that we are welcome to here. Um, we also reach out to the chief and the leadership team to figure out how is it that we can rebuild that trust that will end up in better proactive health care uh, in addition to reactive health care, which is really what we do at, at the hospital. So that's just a couple of examples. I could tell you um, about our in incredibly strong DEIB program, the fact that we're gathering SOGI data at registration. I mean, all of those things that create different levels of psychological and physical fear that prevent patients from, from coming and getting care that we are leaning into, not only on our own initiatives, but we're bringing those folks in and saying, mm -hmm. help us design this properly. So Dr. Minadeo talked about our patient family engagement um, uh, advisory council, and we, we bring those folks in the different constituents to say, how do we do this in registration? How do we create a meaningful environment here? What are the things that you need like examples of food when when you're an inpatient. And so there's just yeah. example after example that I could I could lay out exhaustively, but I won't. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I would say is, um, uh, you know, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out why we are a nonprofit organization and why we don't pay income tax. We pay the highest amount of provider tax, six percent, um, which is seven point six million dollars in a tax. And unlike other states, we only get one point three million dollars back where in most states it's at least a level, if not an advancement for their disproportionate share payment. So if you think about that delta of more than $6 million and the impact that would have on our budget in reducing commercial rate increases, those are other policy issues that lead to, you know, the nonprofit status and some of the things that that drive the cost of care. But thank you. I, I really appreciate the thoughtful responses um, to my questions. I think one of the things that I'm that I'm trying to do, and you know, with your new needs assessment um, coming out, when an organization requests more in their budget than we had put out in guidance, if I see that that in that overage, if you will, is going to meet community need or going to meet um, the uh, the deficit in community benefit. Um, and there are priorities, objectives, uh, key performance indicators that show that money is going toward these things. Um, that becomes a much easier budget to approve. When it's hard to find alignment, then it, it's more of a struggle. So 
Um, I say that hoping in the in the spirit of improvement and the journey you guys are all on. That um, so thanks again for the thoughtful replies. I really appreciate it and um, like hearing about your progress each year. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your attention to those details and and hope that we've done some effort to assure you that that's where we're leaning in. Great. Thank you so much. I think I'll, I'll jump in here next and, and thank you to the Northwest team for your presentation. Uh, hopefully I have some some just clarifying questions for you first to start us off. Um, I just wanted to understand some of the assumptions around the charge increase, the 7%. If you could just break that down for me, how it's going to be distributed inpatient, outpatient, and professional, that'd be helpful. Uh, so our budget request would be an across the board. Um, it would be inpatient, outpatient, um, and professional services. Okay, and can I just ask, with regard to the professional, I I was trying to understand in the narrative, um, and let me just read this to you, this, line, the, this couple of sentences in here. Um, the budget assumes a 0% change to outpatient physician professional fee reimbursement for all payers. However, to ensure compliance with the anticipated budget order language, gross charges for physician professional services will be increased in fiscal year 25 by the same rate as all hospital charges. Could you just help me? I, I, I didn't quite understand what you meant there. Yeah, so last year um, we proposed 7.1% increase to hospital inpatient, a 7.1% increase to hospital outpatient, and a 0% increase to the professional fee. And so when you took the assumed volume for each of those three buckets, it came out to an overall rate increase request of 6%. And so the 6% is what went into the budget order. And that just creates a real challenge for us because if I'm wrong about how much is gonna land in the inpatient bucket or the outpatient bucket or the professional fee bucket, then it's not gonna come out to be 6%. It might come out to be 6.1 or 6.2, right? Because budgets are built upon assumptions. Mm -hmm. So I think this year I'm having a similar challenge because you know, if I say that I'm going to do an across the board rate increase of 7%, so that's why we went in that direction this year. Um, but now we're saying, okay, but what are you really going to, if you if you increase your charge to 7%, what are you really going to get paid in additional money from the commercial payers? And in our case, that's like 6.4%. Um, but again, if I'm wrong about what the mix is between hospital services and professional services, then it's not going to come out to 6.4%. It's going to come out to something a little bit higher or a little bit lower. And if you try to apply that per commercial payer, right, we have 100 of them. Um, we all know the big ones, but there's lots of very small commercial plans. Then I just, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to put something in the order that really truly is an estimate that's coming out on that rate uh, decomposition worksheet. So it's an issue I know I've talked to Elena a lot about and her team um, and happy to talk to you guys about more about that as well. But um, that's why we went for an across the board, but we're still having a challenge. Um, and we've provided some recommended budget order language um, that we think would kind of work for both sides but um you know you guys will would need to take a look at that okay i appreciate that and i'll i may follow up with or follow up with elena to, to better understand that language that you're proposing um what is the assumption that you're making about uh the rate increase for traditional medicare uh i, I believe it's two point i'm gonna ask Devin. two point something so, percent one point seven percent market basket both okay. and outpatient. Okay. And what is the assumption that you're making about uh, Medicare Advantage rate increase? So Medicare Advantage plans, and again, Devin might want to chime in here and help me, but when we look at the data overall, there is a difference between what we ultimately get reimbursed from traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. And I think it's about a 7% um, 
you know, lower or worse um, reimbursement rate from that group. Yeah, and so for that group, we're also we're assuming that from their starting point, they will also go up 1.7% because most of them are tied to Medicare, but not set at 100% of Medicare. Okay. Um, and then what is the assumption that you're making about the, the uh, rate increase from Vermont Medicaid? Zero. And then what is the assumption that you're making about New York Medicaid? Uh, we have very, very little um, New York Medicaid, so we put in, I don't think we put in anything. Okay, so you don't get very many uh, New Yorkers coming over for care. Okay, thank you. Um, I, in the, on the income statement, I'm trying to understand, I'm looking at the uh, projected, sorry, phone ringing, uh, the projected 24, the outpatient care revenue uh, for 24 projected to the 25 budget. And it looks like about $46 million or, you know, a close to a 20% increase when you combine outpatient with outpatient physician. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, that breakdown. That's a, that's a significant bump up. 20% increase in outpatient revenue. And I, I, I have some suspicions about where it's coming from, but I'd like to better understand from your viewpoint, really how that breaks down given that large yeah. increase. Yeah, I think I, I think it's here at 18%. Is that what you're saying? I'm looking at our... Well, I added the, I added the both two lines, right? So, okay. you know, I added the outpatient care revenue and then the outpatient care revenue physician, right? So yeah. if you add them both together, from projected to budget, it's about 20%. So really it goes back to that slide where I showed the roster of all of the providers that are gonna be joining and then the corresponding you know, increases in volumes over off to the side. So not all of those providers are surgeons, um, but some of them are. And so they're all gonna have professional fees, right? But some of them are gonna have surgical volumes and surgical revenues as well. Um, some of them are gonna have DI, you know, procedures, lab procedures. So all of the ancillary revenues that they would generate, um, and they're really hitting that outpatient line and that physician line. So um, it goes back to that, a uh, big influx of providers, all of the recruitment we've done to really try to improve access. Okay, so that's about five, is that about five MDs that are contributing almost $50 million? Is that about right? Um, I think it's more than five. I would have to go back and look. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about the access. Um, I hear, I hear from you all, and I see some of the numbers about the painful weights and the access backlog. Um, and I see the areas where you are increasing uh, FTEs, uh, pathology and cardiology, as you know, as you described in, in the presentation and also in the submission. Um, and it seems to me that the solution uh, to the access problems has been to recruit additional providers, which obviously come at a cost. And I'm wondering, given um, those access challenges, I'm also looking at the clinical productivity that was submitted separate, not the premier work that you described in your presentation, but the work RV used for clinical FTE. And many of those areas where you're adding providers have less than 25% productivity as measured by those national benchmarks. And so I guess my question to you is why add providers rather than increase the productivity of existing providers to achieve the access goals? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you have to do both, right? I think we have a really interesting mix. When I look at that clinical productivity, we've got somebody over the 90th percentile. We have some folks falling between the 50th and 75th, some between the 25th and 50th, but there are some that are below the 25th. You're absolutely right. Um, I can tell you a couple areas, you know, like the pediatric inpatient, that's a volumes issue, right? It's a really important service um, to have for our community. But um, I don't know that from a volume standpoint, we're ever going to be able to get sort of outside of that box. 
Um, I think urology was another area where we were running under the 25%, and that was a contracted service for us. Um, and we recognized the productivity was terrible and have had so many conversations um, to try to improve that and realized we weren't going to get there. So we have recruited our own and our expectation is that it will be better. Um, so I think each one has an interesting story, right? <clears throat> There's one area where I think the provider's still really, really new. Um, so just starting to establish and build a practice. Um, but we have opportunity. Every organization has opportunity. So I think we have to do both. Yeah, so let me just are, jump in there that many of those sure. providers, their compensation is is scaled um, based on their productivity. So we don't have anybody earning at or above the 50th percentile and producing, you know, a lot lower um, with the exception of somebody new. So when a provider comes in, we guarantee their salary while they build the practice, um, which I think we do for about 18 months. Um, and then they go based on RV, RVU as well as other um, quality and safety and, and engagement metrics. Okay, I appreciate that. So what benchmark goal have you set for the clinical providers? We use a 50th percentile benchmark from um, a vendor called Coker Group. And so Coker Group looks at MGMA, they look at Sullivan Cotter, and they look at a group called AMGA, and then they develop a median using those three, and we use the 50th percentile. Okay, so um, there, there are a fair amount that are currently at the 25th percentile or less. Is the expectation that they will be at the 50th percentile in 25? What did you what what assumption about productivity is in the 25 budget? So again, it, we go area by area and we actually go physician by physician and say like, are you new? Are you established? Where are you at currently? Do you, and we make improvements. So like in urgent care, we have built in some improvement. Um, that was one of the groups I think running below the 25th percentile. Um, again, in urology, we have built an improvement. We've got our own now, it's not a contracted service. So not for every area, but for some of the areas we have done that and we have put those increases into 2025. Okay. Um, Sorry, a couple there's teeth in that. So if they don't produce, we adjust their compensation. If that happens multiple years, then we take a look at whether, you know, their goals are aligned with ours as an organization. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple other questions about the income statement. It looked like there were very large reductions in fixed prospective payment. Um, just looking fiscal year 23, it was 21 million, 24 projected is 15 million, and for 25, it's 3.9 million. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that really large decline in fixed prospective payment. Um, so our budget submission assumes that we are not um, a part of one care on January 1st of 2025. So you see okay. three months, three months worth of information and then it would be zero. Okay, and that would explain why the ACO dues are going from 800 to 170. Okay. Um, and do you, can you talk a little bit about that decision then? Um, you know, it was the final year of this version of the ACO, right? So we we very much look forward to, you know, what comes next and evaluating um, the AHEAD model and all of that. But so for us, this final year of participation, it really just came down to a financial decision. So it just was not financially advantageous for us to be in. When we okay. looked at including that in the budget, the rate increase request would have uh, risen to 12%, and we didn't think that that was appropriate. Okay. Um, and you have a million dollars, it looks like, reserved. It's fiscal, you know, so I'm wondering, it's still in the reserve pile there, but you're not participating, so where does that million dollars go? So we'll have to wait for the claims run out to happen for calendar year 2024 um, before we can clear those reserves. It will take almost all of two, 2025, right? So we'll get an idea of whether those reserves can be released, um, you know, come fall of, of next year. Okay. And I guess the last question on the income statement would be the $37 million in other non-salary expense. Can you just remind me of what that is? Yeah. 
yeah, I'll take a look at that. So it's um, it's a lot of contract services and other supplies that don't have um, an identified category here. Um, those are the big the big categories. So I don't have a crosswalk here in front of me, but th those are the big ones. Okay, is it possible just that that's such a large amount of money? Is it possible just in follow up to give it not line item by line item, but just some some smaller bucketed areas for us to yeah. understand what that that would be really oh, helpful. Absolutely. Um, let me just see if those are all of my questions. Oh, I guess just one other question about um, in terms of the. Uh, nope, I think actually that was answered. Yep, I think I'm good. I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Foster or whoever's next. Thank you. I don't have any questions myself at this time. Any other board members? I can go ahead. I have a, uh, just a couple, I think. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So um, my first question is in the narrative, um, and I think this is uh, reproduced or very similar to what you've included on slide, I think it's slide 18 about the access. Could you just go over again how you came up with the percentages? Is that percentage of increased time, percentage of increased revenue, percentage of increased appointments? What What is it a percentage of? Yeah, Devin, do you want to take that one? Oh, sorry, I remember a lot. Which, which uh, item are you referring to? It's um, your slide 18 or on page four of your narrative, you in, you're you talking about your new provider resources and uh, budget to budget increase and in access as a percentage. So for example, cardiology, um, fiscal year 24 budget to fiscal year 25 budget increase in access 30%. And if it'd be easier to follow up, that's fine. It might be. I'm just see if I can pull up the narrative here and uh, yep. refresh my memory on that one. Sure. I know that I know that the office visits are definitely in there. What I'm trying, I'm looking to Devin to see is are the ancillary services included in there as well, or is it just the office visits? Uh, that would have been a measure of just the office visits. Okay, so it's an increase in number of visits. Yes. Or is it money? It's not money, it's visits. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're linked, right, by an underlying rate, of course. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, that question has been answered. Just what else I have here. Um, I was just curious. So, uh, you in for the New England Collaborative Health Network, you talked about the 1.4 million in savings to community partners um, from uh, that opportunity. Um, and Stephanie just talked about uh, the decision around One Care. Did in looking at those two, did you look at how much in PMPMs your community partners would be losing from? The withdrawal from one care. So did you look beyond your own financial calculation? Absolutely. We spent the last year discussing it with the community partners. We met on a monthly basis. Um, it was difficult to get um, the data, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, they some were willing to throw the number out, no problem. Others a little more uh, guarded about it um, and, and couldn't get it from one care either. So but we knew it was substantial and we knew it was going to have a financial impact on them. Um, and so we, you know, we talked with one care about it. We talked with um, each of the partners about it. They understood and, um, you know, we're, we're going to make it work. Thanks. Um, I think those are all my questions that were answered by other folks. So thank you very much. Hey, this is Dave Merman. I just have a couple questions. The first one I think you addressed, which is you don't know the answer, which is what is Northwest Medical Center's relationship with Quorum? Oh, uh, no, we, we know that. So Quorum <laughs> Health Resources 
used to be Q, it became QHR, became Ovation. So we have a strategic partnership with Ovation. What we don't know is how that showed up as our pricing. We've they've never billed for us. They've never done anything. So I'm not sure how the name and our data got blended. But we have a strategic partnership with Ovation uh, Healthcare. They provide us with uh, an incredible access to GPO, benchmarking data, consulting services. Um, they're they're a, a valued and 46 plus year partner. Okay, I, I've seen that relationship, I think in the NASHP data, when you look at health systems, for some reason it puts you in the quorum health system, but um, okay. Um, one quick question from the narrative, there is a grant funded respite program. Sounded like a really great program to apartments that you're able to rent um, mm -hmm. really, I mean, I think you all know that I'm an emergency physician. So these are things that like we interface with often. And this is like, I mean, it sounds like a really valuable resource community. I was just curious if you, one, where the grant came from and two, if there's any um, opportunities or plans for trying to figure out how to sustain that after a grant runs out. Sure, very proud about that. Yeah. I'll turn it over to Stephanie to answer those questions. Yeah, it, it is a really great program and it, it'll escape me now so I can send you exactly, I don't want to get it wrong, exactly where the grant funds are coming from. Um, it's going really well. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to member Walsh's, some of his questions, like we have that program. We actually just started a food bag, pro bag program um, using some grant money as well. And so I think in the narrative, one of the things I asked to be held harmless from was like increases in expenses where there was corresponding grant revenues. Because if there is a grant available out there um, and it would help our community and would help address those community needs, if NMC has to be the one to do it, right? Like, let's do it. Let's go get those grant funds and make that happen. Um, <clears throat> we do think there's a year two grant opportunity, but in year three, it would become, um, okay, Northwestern Medical Center, now you have two years worth of data. Let's run the numbers and say, how many people were we able to place there? What did that save in custodial care expenses here at the hospital? Um, and so does that program pay for itself? And that would be how we keep it going. Okay. That's great. I'm, I was excited to read about that. Um, two more quick questions. Um, I'm curious about uh, your Medicare Advantage plans. Could you know, you don't, you don't have to give it now too, if you could give it and follow up um, your dominant Medicare Advantage plans and, and maybe the couple, top five plans or something by a percentage of, of, of your contractual uh, mix. I think it'd just be helpful to understand who, 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 is, who are the plans in Vermont. And the we last, can give you the top five for sure. That'd be great. And the last uh, question is in around RAND pricing. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at RAND pricing. It, it's displayed in two different ways. One is a percent of Medicare and one is a standardized price. And when comparing hospitals that have un different underlying Medicare reimbursements, the standardized price is really helpful. Um, so you have the lowest standardized price for outpatient services in Vermont, and you have the third lowest standardized price for inpatient services in Vermont, pretty close to the other two uh, for the inpatient, um, a little bit below Copley for outpatient, and then Springfield's a bit above that. And um, I was just, uh, I've asked hospitals what they think about this, but I'm curious what, what you think about these low RAND prices and, and how that impacts your ability to deliver care in your community. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's a double-edged sword. Like we're proud to have really low prices. And, and again, I think, you know, I just heard in the last presentation where you were like, price versus charge versus reimbursement. And we all kind of use these terms differently. And I totally agree with you. And I love the idea of having like standard common language. Um, but I think, you know, what I'm charging and then what I'm getting reimbursed, or in this case, the prices, of course, they're linked, right? So to the extent that a large chunk of our business is, um, you know, based on a percent of charge, if we're looking at the commercial side, then all of those things are linked. Um, it's great to have kind of low prices, but at the same time, if they're too low, it makes it really hard to survive as an organization. So it's all about trying to find the sweet spot. And so I absolutely agree with Copley that it's like 
low is a good thing, but too low is a little bit dangerous. Um, and so I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but um, you know, it's all connected. And I love, I love the idea of being able to develop some common language and looking at it more together because um, the data is pretty cool. I had a chance to dive into it a lot over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and I think like Copley made the point, it 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 becomes relevant when you think about the rate increase request. So you you know if somebody's getting a hundred dollars and you're giving them a five percent uh, rate increase request, that generates you know obviously very different revenue than if someone's charging ten dollars. And so when you're a low cost provider and you've not asked for low for a lot of rate increases. Um, you know, even though our rate increases a little bit more than others, uh, and still less than some too, um, it, it it doesn't always translate into big dollars because we're starting from a low cost. Um, and unfortunately, what we're not able to do because of the way insurance is structured in Vermont, I'd I'd love it if Franklin and Grand Isle counties had insurance rates based on costs that they experienced um, here at Northwestern Medical Center. That'd be great. But but as you know, the way insurance is structured and community rating, it, you know, what our rate increase doesn't correlate to what Blue Cross, you know, will will charge Ben and Jerry's or or Viatech or um, you know the different companies in our area. It's based on what they experience across the state. So it makes it it makes it challenging, uh, and and again, this makes it challenging for you as well. When we say, hey, we've got to control insurance costs for for our community. Well, we're doing our part, um, but they're impacted. You know, you could argue fairly or unfairly. That's not for me to say um, by what goes on in the rest of the state. So. Um, you know, I think that is very complicated when you start to kind of wrap your head around it that way. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for questions or comments from them. Yeah, thank you. Just a few. Um, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate it. And um, thanks for working with us on the Act 119 compliance. Um, I think we have a lot to learn. From each other. I mean, I think we come at it with a different perspective, but we want to listen to your perspective too, because um, we're not in the uh, in the rooms waiting to to talk to people. And um, so, just wanted to briefly note that and, and highlight the work that Emma on our team did. I don't want to take credit for things that I, I didn't do. It was really her her effort <laughs> on our team. Um, just a question about, and, and maybe this reflects my desire for consensus, which I get teased about on our team for a little bit, uh, which is fair. Um, on the New England Collaborative Health Network, one concern that I have transparently is folks might, you know, disagree about how costs are shared or how savings are shared. I'm just wondering if you can, if you feel like that's a reasonable concern to have, or if that's relatively well navigated already. Um. You know, it's always a good discussion to have. Uh, we're different scale uh, organizations. Each of us brings a different size and a different purchasing level. Um, and so, we, you know, where do you hold things flat across the board evenly and where do you scale them based on your size and contribution? Um, the collaborative exists and will survive based on one thing and one thing only, and that's mutual trust. So the way that we've initiated the collaborative is uh, um, in a way that supports the highest level of trust. Um, and so some things are scaled and some things are flat in terms of expenses and benefits. Um, I will tell you, even if you flip the switch early on, there isn't going to be a, a significant amount of difference because generally speaking, we're all small hospitals. Um, so, you know, we're not dealing with David and Goliath here. Um, and, uh, you know, where we can say you contributed this and so this is your fair share back, we do that. And where it's more complicated to do that, um, we try to, to, to flatten things out. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, one thing you talked about in the narrative this is just kind of on a different line um, was about the efficiency of the urgent care and how you wanted to scale that up and how you hope that that would impact patient choice. I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit more because it's hard for me to understand how that would yeah, impact the we, choices. Yeah, we patient measure patient. productivity in urgent care um, by patients per hour per provider. Right. So again, down to the individual provider level, how many patients are they seeing? So we know how many providers we should have. We're not where we need to be. Uh, you know, the industry average is around five. I think that's, 
you know, factory medicine. I wouldn't support nor ask our team uh, to be at five. We're at, I think, just under two. We need to be, we're budgeting to be at two. We really should be at three. And that's reasonable, right? You go to a primary care office, you're seeing about every 20 minutes. Um, and, and that's a reasonable. The, the problem is, you know, we've ratcheted down provider staffing to match what we think the market volume is. Um, it's It's, there are some variabilities in volume that we can predict. Monday's always going to be crazy. Tuesday's always going to be light. It just is predictable. There are seasonality stretches that we can't predict. Why was the last two weeks really slow and then the two weeks you know, preceding that incredibly busy? Um, our, our mechanism to, to enforce some of that stuff is complicated. We've had uh, a near 100% turnover um, in providers simply because when we changed the productivity metric, the providers that were there didn't feel that, you know, seeing two or three patients an hour was reasonable. They felt, I think it was 1.7, um, was, was too much already. Well, we didn't agree with that, so we made that, we made that change. Unfortunately, there's only a limited amount that we can do because I could say shut it down or, or bring it down from two providers or three providers on a day to one or two, but that just means things could get backed up in the emergency department, which A, is expensive, B, gets in the way of care to people who really need emergency care, um, and just creates higher levels of, of dissatisfaction. So we are looking at our systems, our processes, what is it that we're doing in there that makes it take longer or um, or inhibits getting the productivity to where it is. We do use, or we are planning on bringing in Ovation as an example to do an operational analysis who works with hundreds of hospitals across the country. So they could say, you do this process or you have this person do that process and that's wrong. You should really do it this way. So we're, we're making all those changes along with, um, you know, driving forward some cultural changes without doing it so hard and so fast that we throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you will. Thank you, I appreciate that. And all my other questions were answered by other or asked by other board members. So thank you. Back to you, Chair You're Foster. Welcome. Great, um, I don't think there's any other questions for you all and thank you for your thorough presentation today. Um, nice to see you all. We will take a break and adjourn until 2.30 and then we will come back with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Um, thank you, Mr. Wright, and everyone. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, we can go off the record, Michelle. <laughs>